Y'all, I, I don't want to ruin this. Just just watch with me. And Tori, they're not seeing any flakes but wet roads. And now we're starting to experience, unfortunately, in freeze thaw, we see this, water main breaks. Hit by a car, but I'm okay. I just got hit by a car, but I'm well, okay, Tim. That's a first um, for you on okay. TV, Tori. <laughs> That's a first on TV, Tori. Now, Tori, on the other hand, like a bamf, picks herself back up, regains her composure. She actually tries to continue the report. Also, this is a fun note. I'm okay. Yeah, you know, that's live TV for you. It's all good. I actually got hit by a car in college, too, just like that. <laughs> <laughs> she also, a million times better than me, because if I got hit by that car, even at like three miles an hour, I'd be like, ah, my neck, my legs, someone call my lawyers and the insurance. She seems to be letting the person that hit her know that she's fine, it's okay. Ma'am, you, sure okay? you are so sweet and you are okay. It is all good. You then had Tim back in the studio asking, you know, the important question. Tim. Were you bumped down low, Tori, or were you hit up high? I couldn't really tell from the looking. Oh. Which then led to this beautiful gem of a moment. I don't even know, Tim. I, my whole life just flashed before my eyes. Oh, but this happen. is like... Yeah, that can happen. When, when did your ability to be able to emote or feel anything die, Tim? Though, in Tim's defense, when people online were saying, is he a cyborg, he responded, I couldn't see what happened, only audio. Then, I wasn't truly convinced she was okay. But as others have pointed out, that seems to contradict what he said while he was live on on air when he said, you know, I, I saw you just get knocked out of frame. But really, the, the main point of this intro is to say, Tori, you are our BAMF of the day. You showed a level of professionalism I will never even get close to. But with all of that now said, sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Hit that like button or I'll punch you in the throat and let's just jump into it. And then if I were to ask you, how much money do you think the average American makes in a year? What would your guess be? What do you think? Is it 30,000, 50, 70, 100,000? Where, where do you think it is? And I ask that because over the last day, there's this tweet that's gone viral from a professor at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton Business School. Reading, I asked Wharton students what they thought the average American worker makes per year, and 25% of them thought it was over six figures. One of them thought it was $800,000. Really not sure what to make of this, the real number is 45K. Though, to be that fucking guy, uh, the average income is different depending on which agency you're looking at. According to the US Census, the median income was $41,535 in 2020, whereas you had the Social Security Administration saying the average was $53,383, with the median being $34,612. But th that's also arguing semantics, and a lot of the focus has been on the 25% to think that people are making six figures. With people noting these are students from an extremely prestigious school, and what we think is normal is based off of our lived experience. Right? It's absolutely possible that their upbringing influenced their perception, as the average median family income for a student from Penn is $195,000, which is exactly what led to so many people critiquing rich Americans as out of touch. Writing things like, this is why the wealth gap is so toxic to our society. The rich literally have no concept of how anyone actually lives. And most people I've met don't even make 45 k a year, as well as the disconnect between the entitled and the working person is real. These words will go on to public policy jobs, the law, politics, business, just as ignorant of what real life is for most of US society while having the authority to decide our fates. Therein lies the problem. Actually, on the other side, the professor that even tweeted this in the first place said, you know, I think this revelation maybe isn't that big of a deal. Because according to her, a lot of people want to conclude that this says something special about Wharton students. I'm not sure it does. People are notoriously bad at making this kind of estimate, thinking the gap between rich and poor is smaller than it is. This was indeed why I asked business school students. I was curious if they were as biased as ever everyone else. Now, with all of that said, as far as my opinion, the, the number that I think sticks out to me is maybe the most meaningful is the Social Security Administration saying the median is $34,000 a year. And I say that because in this country, we have a well-documented gap between the rich and everybody else. When you're doing the calculations and you have these kind of more rare but extreme numbers in your calculation, average isn't always the best bet. Or let's say we're trying to do this math and you have me, 19 other people, let's say I make a million dollars, they make $50,000. And even though there were 19 others and only one of me, the average in that equation comes out to just under $100,000 a year. Right, a number that's almost double what 95% of the participants made a year. Now, with all that said, I really did wonder, you know, what would your guess be? So on YouTube, I did a poll on our community page saying, hey, out of these options, how much do you think the average American makes? And we found everything kind of gravitated towards the 40,000 number. 15% saying 20K, 63% saying 40, 20% saying 60, and kind of funny, 1% uh, saying 110,000. So not many people from Wharton watch my show. It's fine. And then, do, do y'all remember that Key and Peel sketch where they kind of joked about rappers snitching on themselves and their music? Or poking fun about lyrics that are like, I killed this person, here's how it happened, when it happened. I got a vivid imagination.
Well, as it turns out, there is a bill in New York that a lot of people are trying to get passed regarding this. And in fact, most recently, Jay-Z and a slew of other rappers and artists signed a letter in support of a New York law that would prevent rap lyrics from being used as evidence in court. The bill in question is called Rap Music on Trial, and it was introduced in November by state senators Brad Hoylman and Jamal Bailey, with a bill aiming to, quote, enhance the free speech protections of New Yorkers by banning the use of art created by a defendant as evidence against them in a courtroom. And adding, the legislation will protect all artists and content creators, including rappers from having their lyrics wielded against them by prosecutors. Right, because as things currently stand, works like rap lyrics can be used as evidence against a defendant, but if this law were passed, in order to submit these pieces as evidence, prosecutors would need, quote, clear and convincing proof that there is a literal, factual nexus between creative expression and the facts of the case. And there are actually plenty of examples of lyrics being used as evidence, with the senators noting that back in 2019, Takashi 69s lyrics were introduced in court to compel him to become a government witness to avoid harsher sentencing. Rolling Stone also noting that the late Draco the Ruler was subjected to something similar as well. Right before he was acquitted in a 2016 murder case, prosecutors attempted to use his lyrics against him to try to make jurors think that he brought a group of armed people to target the victim. Lawyers also read the lyrics to Kanye West flashing lights in a case where he was accused of assaulting a photographer. But as Senator Hoyleman argues, nobody thinks Johnny Cash shot a man in Reno just to watch him die, or that David Byrne is a psycho killer. But routinely, rappers have their lyrics used against them in criminal trials. With Senator Bailey adding that the use of rap and hip-hop lyrics in particular is emblematic of the systemic racism that permeates our criminal justice system. Which brings us back to the letter which was signed by Jay-Z, Meek Mill, Big Sean, Fat Joe, Kelly Rowland, Robin Thicke, and more. It was written by Jay-Z's lawyer, Alex Spiro, and University of Richmond professor Eric Nielsen, and states, rather than acknowledge rap music as a form of artistic expression, police and prosecutors argued that the lyrics should be interpreted literally. In the words of one prosecutor, as autobiographical journals. Even though the genre is rooted in a long tradition of storytelling that privileges figurative language, is steeped in hyperbole, and employs all of the same poetic devices we find in more traditional works of poetry. With it adding that these lyrics allow prosecutors to obtain convictions even when other evidence is lacking, and arguing the practice specifically harms young, black, and Latino men who are the overwhelming majority of artists in these cases. With the writers saying they've identified hundreds of cases where rap lyrics were exploited, and noting that it has a potential to be highly prejudicial. Also citing a study where two groups were given identical violent lyrics, one group was told it was a country song, others told it was rap, and they found the people who believe the lyrics came from a rap song were significantly more likely to view them as threatening and in need of regulation than those who believe that they were country lyrics. And with the letter closing, as these and other studies suggest, weaponizing rap music against its creators is racially and culturally discriminatory. It is also an affront to the First Amendment protections that everyone in this country should be entitled to. But from that, I want to take a second to thank the sponsor of today's show, NordVPN, or more directly, NordVPN.com slash Phil. Y'all know I've been a Nord customer for years now, and if you still haven't checked them out by now, you're really missing out on peace of mind that you get by securing your personal data and internet activity. I like the NordVPN servers are ultra fast so I don't have to sacrifice speed for security. Nord gives me both. And they have a strict no logs policy, meaning they don't track, collect, or share your private data like some of the other VPN providers. What's more, one account lets you connect and secure up to six devices in any combination. So you can actually protect yourself and a loved one or two. So with that, you might want to make NordVPN a part of your online security plan for extra safety. So just head on over to NordVPN.com slash Phil right now to get a huge discount on a two year plan plus one free additional month. And just so you know, this free month is only available through YouTube. So what are you waiting for? Go to NordVPN.com slash Phil and it's all risk free with Nord's 30 day money back guarantee. And then in business and entertainment news, the age of the YouTube original is over. With YouTube's chief business officer, Robert Kinsel making a statement this week, making this announcement, noting that YouTube's paid out more than $30 billion to creators, artists, and media companies over the last three years. But adding, however, with rapid growth comes new opportunities and now our investments can make a greater impact on even more creators when applied towards other initiatives like our creator shorts fund, black voices fund, and live shopping programming to name a few. But also it appears that some originals will still trickle through because they say they're going to honor their commitments for shows already in progress. And as far as my personal thoughts on this, I don't really care that YouTube originals is over, but I, I am thankful that it was a thing. And not because like I loved all the content and I was like, I'm really glad Demi Lovato Otto, Will Smith, and others got deals. Rather because we got to see homegrown YouTube creators like Rhett and Link, Markiplier, Liza Koshy, and PewDiePie actually getting original series, YouTube backing them with dollars and attention. Though we also saw people not happy with this move. Creators like Dan TDM tweeted, why grow something that big just to move on to the next thing? Seems a shame that YouTube is just trying to emulate TikTok. With others also just generally criticizing the choice. But I will say, I personally think that it makes sense to focus on, even if you don't use it and you kind of hate it, I think it makes sense for YouTube to focus more on things like YouTube Shorts, because right now, now, TikTok is eating YouTube's lunch. Right? More and more people are using TikTok every day. Hell, we were talking about reports last year that TikTok users are spending more time watching content there than YouTube users. I mean, if you're a YouTube, right, you've been seen as the king of online video for over a decade. 
that's a cause for concern. I mean, YouTube's lucky, and I use that word very loosely because they put a lot of work into it, but they're lucky that they pay out creators so well, especially compared to TikTok. The number of times I've been scrolling on TikTok and someone shares like how much money they're getting paid on a day where they got like 7 million views and it's like 100 or $200, ah. Whereas on YouTube, especially if it was like brand safe content, unfortunately not the kind of content I put out, that's like tens of thousands of dollars. But where I'll end this story is if the YouTube Originals program is shutting down, to Robert Kinsel or whoever is like in charge over there, are we ever going to get Scare PewDiePie 2? According to reports at the time that you canceled it, it appeared that the series was over, you just canceled the release, but you still mentioned him on the platform, you included him in the rewind that wasn't a rewind in 2019, so why not just drop it? And then, while the Supreme Court has a conservative stack and has actually been stacked with Trump's picks, it just dealt him a major blow. With the High Court rejecting Trump's efforts to block the White House from handing over records to the House Committee investigating the insurrection. Right, we've covered this legal battle on the show before, but the, the TLDR is Trump filed a lawsuit against the panel and the National Archives to prevent the committee from seeing seeing key documents, testimonies, and other evidence lawmakers requested. In the suit, Trump argued that the records were protected by executive privilege, which he said still applied to him, even though he's not president anymore, and despite the fact that Biden decided not to exercise his executive privilege over the document. With Trump also claiming that the information has, quote, no reasonable connection to the events of that day or any conceivable legislative purpose. But in an eight to one decision, the Supreme Court said, no, no, what are you talking about? With the only dissenting justice being Justice Clarence Thomas. With the Supreme Court rejecting the effort to block the records from the committee until the lawsuit itself is resolved by the courts, which notably we talked about Trump able to stretch these things out could take months, if not years. And that because it involves a lot of very weighty questions regarding the nature of executive privilege and to use the technical term, other stuff. And as far as more specifics in their ruling, you had the justices writing that there are serious and substantial concerns regarding whether a former president could obtain a court order to prevent disclosure of records, especially when the incumbent president waived their right to exercise executive privilege, but they still agreed with a determination by an appeals court that Trump's claim of privilege over these documents would fail, quote, even if he were the incumbent. So according to reports, within just hours of the ruling, the National Archives began sending roughly 800 pages of documents to the January 6th committee. This including records that the committee has asked for detailing all of Trump's movements and meetings on January 6th. And notably, the lawmakers also asked for information about plans by the administration to undermine the electoral vote count and confirmation by Congress and Trump's pressure campaign to overturn the results of the elections. But as far as if there's anything meaningful in those documents, we have to wait and see. I mean, it's unclear what the panel would do with the documents if it finds damning evidence, though. It could be a criminal referral to the Justice Department, which has its own ongoing January 6th probe. But for now, that is what happened and the road ahead. And then finally, today, we should talk about yesterday, President Biden giving a two-hour press conference. It marked the end of his first year in office. There were a few moments that were going to highlight, and of course, if you want to see the full thing, I'll link down below. First off, you had notable remarks regarding the current situation with Russia, which, as we talked about earlier this week, seems poised to invade Ukraine, though he doesn't think that Putin wants a full-scale war, adding, I think what you're going to see is that it, Russia will be held accountable if it invades, and it depends on what it does. It's one thing if it's a minor incursion, and then we end up having a fight about what to do and not do, etc. But if they actually do what they're capable of doing with the force amassed on the border, it is going to be a disaster for Russia if they further invade Ukraine, and that our allies and partners are ready to impose severe cost and significant harm on Russia in the Russian economy. Well, while Biden's people tried to clarify what we meant, we saw the president of Ukraine tweet, we want to remind the great powers that there are no minor incursions in small nations, just as there are no minor casualties and little grief from the loss of loved ones. Also, another significant moment came from comments Biden made about the upcoming 2022 midterms, which he said easily could be illegitimate and explaining. It, it, I'm not saying it's going to be legit. It's the increase in the prospect of being illegitimate is in direct proportion to us not being able to get these these reforms passed. With that, yes, seeming to reference the voting rights legislation that failed to pass yesterday, as well as things like Republicans over the last year restricting voting rights, gerrymandering like crazy, giving state legislatures the ability to subvert the will of the people. There were also several other notable remarks Biden made while reflecting back on his first year. This including things like admitting that the U.S. should have done more COVID testing earlier on, as well as saying that he didn't expect so much resistance from Republicans. I did not anticipate that there'd be such a stalwart effort to make sure that the most important thing was that President Biden didn't get anything done. Think about this. What are Republicans for? What are they for? Name me one thing they're for. Also notable to me here is he didn't condemn the two Democrats who have also been obstructing his agenda. Right, Manchin and Cinema, though uh, they were kind of referenced in spirit. With Biden saying that he believes that his Build Back Better legislation will be passed in chunks rather than a single bill. And mentioning that without publicly saying that Joe Manchin has single-handedly held this proposal up. And then the final notable thing that I want to touch on, and I think it was the dumbest thing that Biden said, he was asked, how do you plan to win back moderates and independents who cast a ballot for you in 2020, but 
Polls indicate aren't happy with the way you're doing your job now. With Biden responding, I don't believe the polls. That, I personally think, is incredibly dumb. He should be concerned, especially going into the midterms, he should be concerned about what the country's gonna look like and what people are gonna feel going to 2024. Granted, feelings in American politics can be very volatile, but if he really thinks that, and this wasn't just like him not wanting to answer a question or like risk being super, super defensive, uh, that is concerning. But ultimately, that is where this story and today's show ends. As always, thank you for watching. I love yo faces and I'll see you next time.